Good morning. Welcome to worship this Sunday morning, the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Throughout this season after Pentecost, we have been exploring stories of God's people recorded in the Old Testament and thinking together about what they have to say to us today. As we seek new and varied ways to connect with each other during this time of social distancing, our worship services will start to frequently feature special celebrations and recognitions within our congregation and community. In today's service, we will pray for all the students, teachers, and administrators as they begin a new school year. Next week, we will celebrate the peace we share as members of the family of God by remotely passing the peace. If you'd like to participate, take a quick video of someone saying, peace be with you, or, and also with you, or maybe even both, and send it to me for inclusion in this fun video montage that reminds us of our deep connection to one another that surpasses the limits of time and space. Details about how to do this are available in the weekly worship email you receive from the church office. Feel free to follow along with today's worship using the electronic bulletin that you can find by clicking on the link in the description below. And now we proclaim that the Lord, our God, is, our, in, is in our midst. We are gathered in Christ for celebration and praise. O oh, come, let us worship him. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Son of God, you walk on the waters of turmoil to meet us in the midst of your purposed journey for our lives. Help us to recognize your presence, remember your promise, rely on your power, and receive your peace through every storm. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
trust is within borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Then Jesus made his followers get into the boat. He told them to go ahead of him to the other side of the lake. Jesus stayed there to tell the people they could go home. After he said goodbye to them, he went alone up to the hill to pray. It was late, and Jesus was there alone. By the time the boat was already far away from the lake, the boat was having trouble because of the waves, and the wind was blowing against it. Between three and six o'clock in the morning, Jesus' followers were still in the boat. Jesus came to them. He was walking over to the water. When the followers saw him walking on the water, they were afraid. They said, it's a ghost, and cried out in fear. But Jesus quickly spoke to them. He said, have courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter said, Lord, if that is really you, then tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. And Peter left the boat and walked on to the water to Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind and the waves, he became afraid and began to sink. He shouted, Lord, save me. Then Jesus reached out his hand and caught Peter. Jesus said, Your faith is small. Why did you doubt? After Peter and Jesus were in the boat, the wind became calm. Then those who were in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, Truly you are the Son of God. Hi friends. I've been thinking about our word of the week from last week. Abundance. Abundance is when we have enough, even more than enough, of whatever we need. When we have faith in God, we can be brave and bold enough to share what we have knowing that God will take care of us. Sometimes, though, it can be hard to have that kind of faith in God. It can be hard not to think about what might come later so that we save up or hoard the gifts that God gives us. 
What if we run out of food or money? What if we spend time with that hurting person and it takes away from our time with family or friends? Will I have less love or hope or peace if I give away those feelings to others? It's not wrong or bad to sometimes feel this way. In fact, it's so common it has a name, which also happens to be our word of the day, doubt. Doubt is when you aren't sure if something is true, when your faith isn't strong enough to take away all your feelings of worry and fear. In our Bible story for today, Jesus' disciples experience feelings of doubt. When they see Jesus walking across the water, they are afraid. I'd be afraid too if I saw someone walking across water. But Jesus tells them not to be afraid, because it's him coming to join them. Peter says, if it really is you, tell me to come out and walk to you across the water. Jesus says it, and Peter climbs out of the boat. He's able to walk. But as Peter walks across the water, he notices the strong wind, and he starts to feel feelings of doubt. What if he can't make it all the way to Jesus? If he sinks into the water, he might die. Just as those thoughts start to creep into his mind, he does start to sink. Now he's really afraid, so he yells out, help me, Jesus. Lucky for Peter, Jesus is right there to pull him out of the water. And lucky for us, Jesus is always there to help us through times of doubt, too. Sometimes situations or relationships don't go the way we want them to or the way we planned. Our parents, friends, and church family members can let us down. Sometimes we even let ourselves down. But we know that God will never let us down. God is always there to offer comfort and love. Even though we might know that God is trustworthy and faithful, there are always going to be times when each of us feels doubt. Nobody has perfect faith, and having feelings of doubt actually means that you are taking your faith seriously, that you are wrestling with really big questions so that you can understand God better and grow in your relationship with God. But the wonderful thing about God is that God will never abandon you, no matter how much doubt you experience. In fact, God gives us the gift of community so that when we doubt in deep and serious ways, we can know that there is a whole group of people, our faith family, there to hold on to faith for us and with us, to help us ask our questions and seek out answers, to pray with and for us. Isn't that great news? Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for giving us space to doubt sometimes, even when we doubt you. Be with those who are currently experiencing doubt. Help us to recognize them and reach out to them so that we can support them in their questions and struggling. Be with all of us always when we have strong faith, and when the worries of the world make us doubt. Thank you, God, for all these things, and thank you for Jesus. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord and pray to him. Tell the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell about all the wonderful things he has done. Be glad that you are his. Let those who ask the Lord for help to be happy. Depend on the Lord and his strength. Always go to him for help. Remember the wonderful things he has done. Remember his miracles and his decisions. You are descendants of his servant Abraham, the children of Jacob, his chosen people. God ordered a time of hunger in the land, and he destroyed all the food. Then he sent a man ahead of them. It was Joseph who was sold as a slave. They put chains around his feet and an iron ring around his neck. Then the time he had spoken of came. The Lord's words proved that Joseph was right. The king of Egypt sent for Joseph and freed him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him the master of his house. Joseph was in charge of his riches. He could order the pr princes as he wished. He taught the older men to be wise. Praise the Lord. Listen, O people, to the stories of God. Prepare your hearts to hear God's word. Let us pray. God of our present trouble and promised triumph, open our eyes to see you in the midst of our struggles. Open our ears to hear your words of invitation and assurance. Open our hearts to glory in your name and seek strength in your word. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from Genesis, chapter 37. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other's children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. He had another dream and told it to his brother, saying, Look, I have had another dream. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What kind of dream is this that you have had? Shall we indeed come, I and your mother and your brothers, and bow to the ground before you? So his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this matter in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their flocks near Shechem, And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flocks at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So Jacob said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. Joseph came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him in one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him. He said this that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Here ends the reading. With this week's focus reading, we are once again skipping forward along the generational line of the family of Abraham. We spent a few weeks exploring some of the events in the life of Jacob, and now we're shifting to take a look at a few important incidents in the life of his favorite son, Joseph. I was tempted by one of our faith partners to skip writing sermons for these two weeks where we looked at the life of Joseph in favor of showing the Donny Osmond version of my favorite musical, 
Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. This show does do an amazing job of putting flesh on this story, helping us to see the different emotions and struggles of the characters, and encouraging us to connect the story to our own lives, all while giving us more than a dozen very catchy musical numbers that are guaranteed to be stuck in your head for weeks after watching it. Despite the temptation to show you Act 1 of the show this week, which includes the events of today's focus reading, and follow up with Act 2 next week, which shows, among other things, the events we'll cover in next week's reading, despite this temptation, I felt that it would be important for me to speak on these readings, as I think they have a lot to say to us in our present global and national situations. That said, if you haven't seen the Joseph musical, I highly encourage you to track down a copy. Leaving behind the bright colors and energetic dance moves of the stage, at least for now, let's take a look at this piece of Joseph's well-known life story. In keeping with the legacy of their ancestors, the family of Jacob is not exactly the Cleavers or the Bradys or the Waltons. In fact, a lot of the dysfunction of this family can be attributed to, jo to Jacob himself and his very open favoritism. His decades-long infatuation with his second wife, Rachel, to the detriment of his first wife, Leah, has now transferred to Rachel's two children, and especially to her oldest, Joseph. The text tells us that jealousy and resentment caused all of Joseph's brothers to hate him so much that they could not speak peaceably to him. And the eldest of the only two girls who bickered constantly, I can only imagine what the fighting must have been like among 12 brothers, especially with a father who clearly didn't have any experience with nurturing healthy family relationships. And so with this morning's story, we step into the middle of a family feud. Joseph's brothers can't stand his arrogance and the way Jacob favors him. The description of the coat he received as having sleeves might even indicate that Jacob didn't require Joseph to work nearly as much as his brothers, as a coat with sleeves would get in the way of the hard work of shepherding flocks and growing wheat. As Joseph doesn't make it any easier for his brothers to tolerate him, sharing quite boldly his dreams about how he felt himself superior to his brothers, and even saw himself as the literal center of the universe, with his entire family bowing down to him. No wonder his brothers couldn't stand him. At this point, we reach the main action of today's reading. Jacob sends Joseph to check on his brothers as they tend to the flocks. There's no indication as to why Joseph isn't already out there with them, but we can surmise that he is at home with his father, while the rest are working because of that cursed favoritism. So when the brothers see Joseph approaching, they decide that they've had enough. Here comes the dreamer, they say. Let's kill him and throw him in a pit. After some reconsideration, they decide not to kill him, but they throw him in the pit alive until they can decide what to do next. Conveniently, they see some traders traveling in the distance, and they get the idea that they could sell him as a slave and make some money from the deal while still being rid of his annoying arrogance. The story is very brief and matter-of-fact about the conclusion to this tragic tale. The brothers pull him from the pit, trade him for 20 pieces of silver, and off Joseph goes to Egypt. What are we to make of this story? Isn't this supposed to be the beginning of the bold, faithful, innumerable descendants promised to Abraham? Yes, Abraham and Sarah got off to a rough start, but you'd think by now the special chosen people of God would have it together just a bit more than this. Fratricide, the killing of a brother, was already dealt with ages ago with Cain and Abel. The sons of Jacob, also known as Israel, should be better than this, shouldn't they? If you're new to the biblical narrative, you might think so. But the full story, as it continues on, shows us that none of God's people ever really figure it out. God's people are always selfish and sinful. And that behavior inevitably leads to a lot of suffering. The story doesn't say so at this point, but later it is revealed that Joseph pleaded in anguish for his life, fearful of what would happen to him in Egypt, and that his brothers ignored his cries. And after ripping Joseph's special robe and dousing it in the blood of a goat, 
they bring even more suffering when they tell their father that Joseph is gone, allowing him to believe that Joseph was eaten by a wild animal. Jacob's sons show how much they love their father by attempting to console him, but it's too late. Jacob's unfair treatment of Joseph, Joseph's arrogance, and the brothers' jealousy have all led to deep suffering for everyone involved in this broken family. At this point, we might ask, where is God in all of this? After all, this is still the same family that just a few generations ago God promised to bless with land and many children. Well, Jacob has the land and the children, but none of it seems to be a blessing to anyone right now. In fact, if we look closely at this reading and the whole chapter into which it fits, we'll see that God isn't mentioned at all. God seems entirely absent. God might seem absent to a lot of us right now, too. Every day there is more mourning as new families grieve the loss of loved ones to the coronavirus. Some people feel threatened by the changes that are being called for in the way we live our lives and in the way we treat people in our country. Other people feel threatened by the lack of change. There is evidence of favoritism, arrogance, and jealousy. There is selfishness, greed, and the deep rejection of the humanity of others who think or act or look different. We, too, are in the middle of a family feud, as certainly as Jacob and his family were so long ago. And where is God in all of this? Is God absent from our story, too? Before we come to that kind of conclusion, let's look back at our text from today. While God is not mentioned by name, there is certainly some evidence of God's presence to be found. First, we see Reuben stepping up to dissuade his brothers from taking the final evil step of murdering their brother. As with a lot of the stories in Genesis, the text doesn't give us any insight into the motivations or feelings of the characters as they act. So we can't ever know for sure why Reuben made the choice to try to save his brother's life. After all, Reuben was just as much a victim of his father's favoritism and Joseph's arrogance as the rest. But Reuben was the oldest of Jacob's sons, and so maybe his behavior has something to do with his sense of duty to his father and to the, the family as the eldest brother. Or perhaps the mercy he shows toward Joseph and Jacob is a hint of God's presence in the midst of this family struggle. Again, if we look closely, we can see even more evidence. In describing the band of travelers who are on their way to Egypt and happen to pass by, the text gets a little bit confused about their identity. At some points, they are called Ishmaelites. At other points, they are called Midianites. Scholars believe that this confusion is the result of two different stories about the life of Joseph getting mashed together by someone who wanted to include the details of both stories into one smooth narrative. But what both groups have in common is that they are not the aloof strangers that they might seem to be. They are actually members of the family. If we think back several weeks ago to our readings about how Abraham and Sarah tried to navigate God's promise of a son, well, recall that Abraham and Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, who was the older half-brother of Isaac, the grandfather of Joseph and his brothers. So Ishmael would have been Joseph's great uncle, and Ishmaelites would refer to his second, third, and fourth cousins. Similarly, Midian was a lesser-known son of Abraham, born to his second wife, Keturah, whom he married after the death of Sarah. So again, Midianites would describe the extended family members of this group of warring brothers, related through their great-grandfather and patriarch, Abraham. It is unlikely that the traveling Ishmaelites or Midianites would not have been aware of this family connection as they talked and inter interacted with the angry group of brothers who were attempting to rid themselves of the nuisance Joseph. But they agreed to buy him and take him with them to Egypt. Why? Well, could it be that they knew the brothers would commit their act of family infidelity regardless of their involvement and felt that their involvement would resolve the issue with the least harm done? 
We can never know for sure. But what we do know is that Joseph was eventually sold by this caravan of traders into the house of the rich and powerful Potiphar, where they could be reasonably assured that he would be used more as a house servant, fed and clothed adequately, and not subjected to the horrors of slaves who toiled in the fields or the mines. So maybe, just maybe, there is a glimmer of God's presence in this story. And maybe, just maybe, we can see such a glimmer in the face of the suffering we are experiencing in this time and place, if only we have eyes to see it. When bad things happen to good people or to God's people, we often respond by asking, why? It doesn't make any sense why God would cause such pain and anguish, why God wouldn't intervene to save Joseph from a life of slavery and isolation from his family, why God would allow one kind of virus to infect and kill over half a million people, or allow another kind of virus to sow hate into the hearts of so many who want to see the destruction of their political enemies rather than the reconciliation and justice of God. It can be frustrating to have these questions, to ask why over and over again, and to get no answer. There really is no good answer to why. God never explains why disasters happen, why families fight, why individuals and groups hurt each other. God never guarantees that suffering will be prevented or removed. But I think that's because pat answers that God will fix everything quickly do not help. When we suffer, we know that things can never completely go back to how they were. When we suffer, our eyes are open to the reality that the world is not as God intends for it to be. And so, instead of empty promises or unsatisfying answers, God gives us the gift of faith. Faith offers confidence that God can be trusted in the midst of suffering, that God is present and active, even if much remains unclear and uncertain. And this trust isn't based on a particular outcome, a particular solution that we might want, no matter how desirable that solution might be. It is based on the nature of God as dependable, faithful, loving, and just. Because we know God, we can join the psalmist in declaring, Surely his salvation is at hand. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. We know that this is the true end of the story because we know that God has promised to reconcile and renew all things. If it hasn't yet been reconciled, keep going. The story isn't over yet. For this comforting and uplifting truth, thanks be to God. Amen.
throughout the season after Pentecost, we will recognize the church's commemorations of various individuals and communities that occur throughout the week. This week, we commemorate Lawrence of Rome, Maximilian Kolbe, and Kai Munk. Lawrence was a third century deacon of the Church of Rome. When the emperor demanded he hand over the church's treasure, Lawrence asked for three days to make an inventory. Over those three days, he gave everything of value to those in need and then presented the emperor's soldiers with a collection of orph orphans, lepers, and the like, saying, Behold, the true treasure of the church. Truly, we are far richer than your emperor. The authorities, enraged, put him to death. Maximilian Kolbe was a Catholic priest arrested by the Nazis and confined in Auschwitz. When another prisoner was condemned to die, Kolbe volunteered to be starved to death in his place. He died in 1941. Kai Munch was a Danish Lutheran pastor who denounced the Nazi occupation of Denmark during World War II. He wrote num numerous sermons, articles, and plays that highlighted the anti-Christian nature of the movement. He was arrested and executed in 1944. Let us pray in remembrance and celebration. Gracious God, we praise you for the gift of your church, gathered throughout all time and space through the cross of your Son. Remind us of those people you have gathered to yourself, including Lawrence, Maximilian, and Kai, and strengthen our witness to you, following wherever you lead. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As a new school year begins, we typically invite our students to bring a backpack and our teachers to bring a bag or briefcase so that we can bless them as they embark on this new year-long journey of learning and supporting one another. This year, there are many disruptions to the regular rhythm of the school year for many of our students, teachers, staff people, and administrators. Please join me this morning as we pray for all those who have ret returned or are returning to school in some form in coming weeks. As I pray, we will see pictures of some of the students and school staff for whom we pray. Lord of all knowledge, we thank you for the gift of education and for the opportunity to grow in our knowledge and wisdom every day. As schools resume or prepare to resume their activities, we pray for all teachers, administrators, staff members, and students. Be close to the students, teachers, and staff people who are returning to an in-person school model. Help them to cope with inevitable changes, to support each other through disappointments when certain activities don't look quite the same as they used to. Give them wisdom and patience to behave in ways that support the safety and learning of all. God of security, hear our prayer. Be close to the students, teachers, and staff people who are navigating new ways of learning, whether through homeschool, remote learning, or a hybrid model. Strengthen their resolve and give them creative and patient minds to accomplish your work in their individual vocations as students or leaders. God of comfort, hear our prayer. Be with all those who are feeling left behind by the changes we must navigate during this time. Open our eyes to ways we can support those for whom this school year presents new challenges. Working parents, low-income students, students and teachers and staff with compromised immune systems. Give strength to those and all people who are in need of prayer, especially those we now name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. God of solace, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, O oh God, we lift these prayers and those sighs that are too deep for words to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessed assurance that Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation, purchase of God in his blood this in my story yeah, this in my song praising my Savior all the day long this in my story yeah, this is my Descending, bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, yeah, this is my song, praising my Savior. This is my story, yeah, this is my song, I'm praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, yeah, this is my song, I'm praising my Savior.
word of faith is near you, on your lips and in your heart. May the generous blessing and favor of our God lift you and sustain you. And now, gracious God, send us out with confidence in your love. Gathered in friendship, we leave as your people. Gracious God, send us out to proclaim your love. Growing in faith, we share your good news. Gracious God, send us out to live your love. Serving all people, we are your hands and voice. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. As we prepare to exit this holy space of worship, I want to remind you that our Facebook and YouTube pages are very active. You do not have to have a Facebook or YouTube account to access these pages. I invite you to stop by regularly for news, daily devotions, and other information. Additionally, I wish to remind you that even if our church building has been closed, our church has never closed. Our ministry is ongoing, and our support for our community is ongoing. We ask for your continuing prayers and financial support so that we may continue to be the hands and voice of Jesus in our world. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you also to all of our worship leaders this morning, both those on screen and those behind the screens. We close this morning's celebration together. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.